Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're continuing the study of the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, chapter 14, verse 8. Now we've obviously already covered a lot of ground. We probably have about 15 videos already on, on this subject or this book. Uh, so if you haven't seen it from the beginning, I invite you to go to my YouTube channel, uh, start from the very beginning, and uh, that's the best way to, you're going to get the most out of this uh, study if you watch it uh, from the beginning in context. <clears throat> All right, before we get started though, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi. Hi, this is Ted here, and my channel is God's Truth Ministries. I've got some just a few videos on there about uh, the gospel of our great Savior Jesus Christ and a few other videos that will really uh, encourage you Christians, I hope, and uh, tell you about our riches in Christ. I hope you guys will stick around for this study in Acts. We're getting into the true uh, human drama. This is real history of what happened uh, in the early days of the church, and it is a blessing to see their example of boldness and, uh, and joy in spite of the circumstances. So it, it's helping me. I hope you guys will stick around. Back to you. All right, and this is uh, Joe from the uh, Sebastian Dresden channel, a channel for just uh, fellowship and learning. And uh, I highly suggest uh, Ted's channel and Luke's channel for uh, questions, or uh, if there's something, if you're having a slow time on your subscriptions and you're wanting something interesting to watch, I found a, a, just a bunch of uh, interesting stuff there. So, uh, I'm looking forward to today's study, and I guess that can be added to the list of interesting things to watch in the future if you can't stick around for this. Over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, so uh, we're in Acts chapter 14, verse 8. Uh, I guess just to give it a little context, I'll, I'll read from verse 1, <clears throat> but then we'll, we'll start discussing it from verse 8. So uh, reading in the KJV, it says, uh, <clears throat> And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that, uh, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part uh, held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, uh, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. So, verse 8 now, uh, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, uh, impotent in his feet, uh, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly, beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Who's first today, brother? Uh, I think I was first yesterday, so uh, I'll let you go this time, Ted. Okay, and I was going to tell you, Joe, when you talk, make sure you bring your uh, your voice piece down because it's, it's muffled up, up beside your head there, so... Bring it down by your mouth so we hear you the more boldly, brother. But, uh, no, this is good stuff, and thank you, Luke, for reading that. And, uh, you know, this is, this is as you said, Luke, uh, how Jesus uh, promised that these signs would, would confirm uh, the apostles' message. I think, you know, you've, you've made it a point here that's really good for our audience, brother, that these are signs and wonders. These are signs. They, they are signs. They signify... <laughs> They point to, they confirm uh, all the ways it's been put there that uh, 
that confirm these apostles are, are truly from God and that their that their message is true. And I think we see an instance of that here. Uh, uh, this man was crippled in his feet for, from his mother from birth. This man didn't just you know meet with an accident and uh, have this happen to him. This was this was a tragic thing. He had never walked. It says at the end of verse eight there. Uh, this man is someone who heard Paul speak, and uh, Paul, you know, knew that this guy, uh, this obviously was uh, revealed to Paul by the Lord. You don't know what's in someone's heart. You don't see faith unless it's demonstrated by, you know, some kind of uh, good work or something or, or charitable deed or something. You don't see faith in action uh, unless it's in action. Paul just knew that this guy had faith. Now, this is, a, this is a miracle in and of itself. I'd never thought about this before. But for Paul to know that this guy had faith to be healed had to be revealed to Paul by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, perceiving, uh, knowing in his mind that, that this guy had faith to be healed, Paul just, once again, does something bold. Uh, says boldly, with a loud voice. There's no... Uh, uh, there's no uh, candle under the bushel with with Paul and these and these apostles. They're bold. He said with a loud voice, "Stand upright on thy feet," and the guy leaped and walked. What an amazing thing! He didn't just hobble up to the podium like we see in uh, some. And I don't want to doubt the miraculous healing of God today, and that He does heal people, and how God chooses to do that is fine with me. Uh, but this is just truly a, a miraculous and instantaneous delivery. It was it was just instant, and it's just miraculous, and it's completely full. The guy was completely well and healed after being crippled from birth. Just another amazing miracle uh, here in Acts. Uh, back to you guys. Okay. Uh, can I ask how my, my microphone is now? Yeah, seems good. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Much great, clearer. Great. Much better. Thank you, Ted. All right. Uh, what I what I see here is uh, a repeat of uh, what seems to have been happening ever since uh, Peter's first uh, message in the uh, temple, uh, where he uh, healed a man of similar circumstance, and great multitudes came to the Lord. And then, of course, we had the heal the next healing uh, uh, by Paul, where uh, the whole city was uh, uh, amazed, and. Uh, so I'm expecting big things here. It seems like every time somebody gets healed, a lot of people believe. And to, to tap into what you were saying about him uh, knowing that the man had faith to be healed, I started thinking, now, did the Lord ever heal anybody that didn't believe? And, and I can't think of any times, except once he did come into a city where he said, I, I, I'm not healing here because there's no faith. And, and I don't think God needs someone to have faith to be healed. Uh, I'm uh, reminded of Walter Martin, uh, a, a great sermon I heard from him once where he said he had all of the faith in the world and, and he believed in faith healing uh, more than, than anybody. And he went into a, his first uh, ministerial position and went into a hospital and he, he was just absolutely certain he was going to cure a man who was dying of cancer. And, or God would through him, and he prayed his heart out with every single ounce of faith that he had, and the man died. And then he was crushed, and his faith was uh, uh, established, and he, he was having a rough time, but yet he was in a ministerial position and, and was just for the sake of the position of the job <laughs> required to pray over people who were sick. And the next person he went to was also in a critical uh, situation, and he had absolutely no faith whatsoever. And he half-heartedly and disgruntedly put his hand on the guy and said, uh, "Maybe God heal you." And the guy was healed miraculously. And so I, I don't know that that uh, what part faith plays in the person doing the praying, but I. I do think that there is something to it, but I don't know what exactly. Uh, evidently, uh, people that get healed are destined to be believers, and if someone's not destined to be a believer, maybe he's not destined to be healed. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but I, I do uh, uh, re 
rejoice at the at the event that did happen. And uh, so, just some some things that are passing through my mind. Over to you, Luke. Hmm. The uh, you uh, you were wondering if uh, anybody got healed who didn't um, have faith to be healed or seek healing, I guess. And uh, I remember just, I think it was just the very last case of healing. If not the, it's not the last one in the study, but one I very clearly remember that uh, we made the point that this person was healed. They weren't seeking healing. They weren't, you know, demonstrating any faith to be healed. They're just minding their own business. And it was a Paul or Peter, I don't remember which one it was, but uh, they just walked over to him and said, "You're gonna." They healed him. I don't want to say against their will, but they they weren't, as I said, they weren't asking for it, or there was no demonstration of faith, and they healed him. So uh, I remember that very clearly from uh, one of the, the most recent studies we've done here. It was the guy at the temp it was the guy at the temple, Luke. He was asking for money and they said, We don't have money, but here's a healing. Yeah. All right, well if whether it's that one, that might be even another one. Uh, but it seemed like the one at the temple was uh, was farther back in the study. I, I don't I don't know if I have my the order of miracles all memorized, but uh, the, how do we know that you, know, the, you guys made the point that uh, uh, God revealed it to them that he had faith to be healed. Well, the way it states it there is um, uh, the same heard Paul speak who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed um, said stand up, uh, said with a loud voice stand upright on thy feet and he leaped and walked. Now if we look at the Amplified, it, it says, this man was listening to Paul as he spoke, and Paul looked intently at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. Um, I'm not getting the impression that God revealed to Paul that uh, this guy has faith to be healed. He just, maybe it's, uh, I'm getting more the impression that uh, it was body language. Paul looked at him, and the guy maybe was on his knees and, Looking to Paul and, and like praying and look, look like I, you know, he he wanted to be healed. It, was, it maybe it was obvious as he looked at him, he perceived it. <clears throat> now you guys may be right. Maybe God told him, "Hey, that guy has faith to be healed and heal him." But um, I, I, it doesn't say that. Uh, so I'm more inclined to go with the other thing. He just looked at the guy and recognized that he wanted to be healed. Um, but the interesting thing to me. Uh, two things really. One is this: the idea of this signs and wonders. We've said it over and over and over again. Um, going back to Jesus's ministry, and then with Peter's miracles, and the other apostles doing signs and wonders, and now Paul, Paul's doing it. Uh, signs and wonders, and then people are healed. It's clear, clearly a miracle, and then that uh, that causes many people to believe. It's it's a uh, uh, I forgot the word, uh, but it was like a, a testimony of the, the legitimacy of these apostles. Uh, the, the, it, uh, it was a stamp of approval saying, look, this healing is uh, gave them the confidence that this is legit. That, uh, and uh, the, the other thing, of course, is the, uh, the idea of him leaping. And walking. Now I've seen, I've heard that one before too. Uh, I don't remember if it was Jesus or or Peter or who. I, I specifically remember someone being healed and they leaped up, and that's pretty dramatic. It says it's 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 not just as something uh, uh, a case where. The guy is, is able to stand up and be feeble, and he's he's able to walk a little bit, but he's it's, it's, he's not stable. And this, this is a dramatic thing where he's, whoa, he's so healed he can leap. Um, so that was just even more of a dramatic statement saying this is a real healing. No one can deny it. Uh, and 
I think uh, Ted, you, know, you you referenced the healings today that, uh, and I'm, I, I you know, we've talked about this off and on many times now. That uh, what about the healings today? Are, are is God still healing people? Yeah, of course, there are still miraculous things. I've observed miracles, uh, see my video, Signs and Wonders, and uh, I, I tell you about the miracles I've witnessed. Uh, there, there's no doubt in my mind. It's just as obvious to me as the man leaping up and being healed. It, that's how clear it was that it was a miracle. So miracles are still happening. God's still answering prayers. God's still healing. But the difference today is that we don't have, I don't think, individuals designated by God as this is a healer. Wherever they go, they're going to be healing people. Uh, that's what I think is uh, missing today. Uh, and that there are people that claim it. We've got Benny Hinn and, uh, you know, probably dozens of others that are uh, famously doing this. But uh, I question the legitimacy of those healings. And uh, if, they, if it was true that they could just heal everybody that comes up to be healed, and why aren't they going to the hospitals and healing everybody in the hospitals if it's uh, such a, um, if, it's, if it's truly there, have this gift of healing? We talked before about the, what was the, the office of healing that we were arguing about once before, or, but it, it, some people did get a gift as healers. And today, I don't think that uh, that's the case. But uh, go ahead, any, any more thoughts before we continue? None for me, Luke. Nope. Uh, back to you, brother. All right. Rarely, rarely am I, am I so, I guess, so thorough there's nothing left to be said. Hmm. Well, actually, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let me read on then. Back to the KJV. Um, um, 11, verse 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, um, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Juniper, Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Uh, let me stop. Well, let, me, let me read a little further, I guess. Verse 13, then the priest of Jupiter which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, um, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Uh, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Verse 18, I guess. We'll stop there. Well, this you talk about amazing and what can happen uh, just among people. Uh, the miracle was one thing, but then it's it's. I don't think we understand how how superstitious some people. Uh, Back then, where I mean, we've you know, being here in America and this nation established for the last couple of hundred plus years, uh, you know, founded on Christian principles and raised in Christian beliefs for the most part. Uh, we've had generations of generations of generations who've uh, gone away from what we would call traditional idol worship. Now, we still have idolatry of, of people's hearts today, I think, of course, but uh. As far as uh, superstitions and uh, religious beliefs that were uh, of that origin, of, of, of Greek uh, paganisms, uh, I was going to have you look at this in the Amplified Luke. I was going to look in the uh, Young's Literal Translation about the translation of the names that they gave them, uh, that the people called uh, Paul and Barnabas there. Uh, 
it's just they believe there were some kind of Greek gods that came down from them, from heaven to these people. And Paul said, listen, no, 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 we're, we're flesh and blood humans just like you guys. Please <laughs> chill out. I mean, uh, listen, the, the one creator God who made us all, made us too. We're, we're of like passions, I think he says. Uh, you know, We're just flesh and blood. Turn from these vanities to the true and living God. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rebuke, but it's kind of like Paul saying, listen, listen, wait a minute. Really, you guys need to get this into perspective. Um, and that's all I have on that. Yeah, we we uh we have to remember that we're in the seat of uh, of a Roman uh, goddess god and goddess worship. Uh, Antioch, if I remember right, uh, was uh, the third greatest city in the Roman Empire uh, to the east of uh, Rome, uh, even. Uh, only surpassed by Alexandria, and uh, uh, I forget what the other one was, but uh, this is a hotbed, so they're not too far away, and they're still within, you know, the Roman Empire. Now, I did a, a, a quick uh, search here, and Jupiter is the god of the sky and of thunder and king of all gods in ancient Rome. And then uh, Mercury, of course, uh, we remember as Hermes, uh, which is the uh, Roman god of messengers. Uh, and so uh, snakes intertwine his staff. Uh, you, you, know, you know the ones. So they're, they're actually giving uh, Paul and Barnabas a huge compliment. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're calling them gods. Now, this was highly uh, irregular. Now, they must have been aware of the Spirit of God within them. I'm not saying they were believers, obviously, but uh, something made them aware that these guys were very special. Now, anyone that laid title to being a god in flesh other than Caesar is unheard of. You know, Caesar claimed to be a god, and people accepted it at the point of a sword. But... Uh, I don't remember too many times in history where uh, the, the people of Rome or the people of the Roman Empire laid titles of God on men that were walking among them. I, I think this is highly unusual, and, it, and it, it speaks to us of the great presence that they had. Uh, so it was an adornment. But uh, Paul later in the verses here calls it vanity. So uh, we, I guess we could uh, try to discern uh, how Paul saw this. But the, the greater point is that he was redirecting their praise to the true and living God, the one who made everything, and away from the uh, 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 type of gods that were common of the day. And I'm just amazed that they would uh, call two men walking among them, gods like this. And not, not just gods, but the god of all things, Hermes, and, and then uh, uh, the, the god of the sky and thunder, uh, Jupiter. So, amazing to me. Like, those are my thoughts. Back to you. Well, it's, it's not an everyday thing, but it wasn't completely uncommon. In the scriptures, we... Uh, I'm... I can't give you off the top of my head an example, but I'm pretty sure there are a couple of examples of prophets in the Old Testament also uh, doing miracles and people responding them in that way. There are certainly examples of angelic beings appearing to men and uh, men wanting to worship them. Um, I believe there's another example of Peter also getting this kind of reaction. Um, and now we have Paul and Barnabas, the people want to worship them. And in every one of these examples, whether it's a prophet, an apostle, or an angel, when, when people want to worship them, every time they're rebuked and say, no, we're not God. Don't we're only worship God. There is one exception, though, and that's Jesus Christ. When people work, begin to worship him, he doesn't rebuke them. He accepts their worship because he is worthy. He is God manifest in the flesh. 
Uh, the um, let me see. There's something in the end there I want to look at. Uh, verse 14. Okay, verse 18, even saying these words with difficulty, this is in the Amplified, even saying these words with difficulty, they prevented the people from offering sacrifices to them. So that's another way of just saying that they they would not allow the people to make a sacrifice or worship them as, as God. Um, all right, before I go on, any other thoughts? Uh, just, just one. Uh you know, thinking back to, you know, courses I've had and, and stuff like this, uh, it was, it did happen where Roman citizens would uh, call Caesar God and they would call certain other people's demigods were half God, half man. But this is really unusual and uh, for that culture. And I, I do want to point out the fact that uh, were these men not uh, uh, the godly men they were, uh, they could have set themselves up for a huge profit. I mean, in gain of gold and silver and offerings and and uh, being worshipped. Uh, you know, the devil and his crew uh, live for such opportunity. But uh, being godly men, it, I'm sure it never crossed their mind. Uh, but uh, make no mistake, they could have uh, profited greatly should they desire uh, to... Uh, to sin like that, I, I, maybe that's not even uh, appropriate to say, but it, it crossed my mind. Hmm. Well, um, if, if 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 Benny Hinn were walking through the streets, I have a feeling he'd get new jet planes and have a couple of new mansions overnight. Yeah. The. Um as we said, the uh, angelic beings, the prophets, and the apostles, their response is proper. They uh, correct the people and say, I'm not to be worshipped. Uh, but there are a couple examples. We talked about Nebuchadnezzar uh, and uh, you know the troubles that came upon him because he didn't denounce the... Uh, I forgot exactly how it transpired, but... Uh, uh, he either said something or somebody said something about it. He didn't correct them and, and uh, the, didn't correct the people from thinking that, hey, he should be worshipped too. And then there was someone in, in the study of Acts, just one of the recent chapters. With that was Acts. Herod in Acts 12. Yeah. Herod. Okay. Yeah. So Herod, you know, he was, he was killed uh, because he uh, accepted the, wor the worship without correcting the people. Um, uh, I don't know if it would be worship or just praise so high that it should be only reserved for God, and he, he failed to correct them. So uh, it's a good thing that the apostles did respond correctly because you know maybe things would have been different uh, because God doesn't like people accepting the worship uh, that that's, uh, only he deserves. Uh, let me go on. Chapter uh, back to the KJV. Um, trying to keep losing my place. Uh, I got it. What verse was I on? Okay, verse 19. Yeah, verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead uh, howbeit as the disciples stood around about him he rose up and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe um, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and, and Antioch. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I know why you're laughing, I think. Uh, I mean, it's like if you're thinking what I'm thinking, brother, I mean, here's Paul and, you know, Barnabas too, but Paul specifically uh, loved and adored and worshipped 
uh, just did a, a couple of ver few verses before. <laughs> now he's just absolutely hated and despised so much that they stoned him uh, to kill him uh, in verse 19. Uh, just I could I know you read on, but I couldn't get past that, brother. Um, I, I just. He rose up after this. I mean, it's it's just this is just amazing. This is the stuff in Acts that you know. You can't make this stuff up, and God doesn't really uh, spare us the details that uh, we don't need to have. I mean, uh, th there's a love hate thing going on for for Paul uh, and Barnabas. There, uh, they stone him. They threw him out of the city. Thought he was dead. The disciples came and just stood around him. It doesn't say they laid hands on him. It just says they stood around him looking at him, probably, you know, kind of dumbfounded. And uh, he rose up and came into the city. Sounds like the same day. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. This is, this is just some amazing stuff that, you, you know, when you're reading that, you're just hitting me with bang, bang, bang action details and just major things. And uh, sorry, brother, I couldn't get past the first couple of verses. <laughs> Over to you, Joe. Yeah, that's, you sound like me now, Ted. I'm the one that gets stuck on something like that, and and I'm with you. I kind of got stuck on that. What does this remind you guys of? Uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind is Palm Sunday. <laughs> here they, here Christ uh, comes into Jerusalem, and uh, he's worshipped as uh, the Messiah, and it ain't uh, three days later they're nailing him to a cross. These same people, uh, and it wasn't a day before they were. Uh, crying out for his his uh, death, you know the Jews are a fickle people, aren't they? I, I guess it's a, it's the uh, condition of mankind. Rather, than, I don't want to just put this on the Jews, but uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, uh, had such a uh, magnificent presence that without the the, the Pharisaical or Jewish uh, contraindication. Uh, they're worshipped, uh, and and uh, give the Pharisees a couple of days to whisper in the ears of the masses, and now they they're turning to kill them, and so it, very much like Palm Sunday uh, with Christ in Jerusalem. So uh, another thing, they thought he was dead. They drug his dead body out of the city, and uh, there's a miracle for you. I mean, he must have been plummeted with stones to the point. Where everyone assumed he was dead, and that's that's an incredible beating, and and uh, you can't help but chuckle. I suppose it's inappropriate that he gets up, dusts himself off, and turns right around and goes back and starts his journey again, uh, hitting the places, you know. So absolutely an incredible couple of verses there. Back to you, Luke. Well, let's let's examine more about where everything's happening here. In verse six, um, um, so in verse five it says that uh, the Jews they wanted to stone stone them. So uh, when they became aware of it, Paul and Barnabas they fled to Lystra and Derby. So they're so they're already out to stone them. Okay. These Jews that were in uh, Iconium, uh, and then uh, uh, so they uh, they they flee to um, uh, they fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Laconia, and under the region that lies round about. So they're not in um, Iconium, but it's it's maybe Iconium is like a county. And uh, the cities are uh, Lystra and Derby, uh, but it's the same general area. So these Jews in in uh, Lystra want to stone him. They leave, and then they start preaching and uh, right next near in nearby towns, and um, they uh, they healed, did another healing. Then they uh, they they want to worship him, they reject the worship, but then the the, the, the Jews from uh, Iconium come, let me see, where is that verse is that? 
Okay. Let's see. Verse 19. And came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. So they're from Antioch, but also from Iconium, where they were already out to stone them. So they're following them, and they're they're pursuing them. It kind of reminds me of that thorn in the side, uh, thorn in the flesh that we talked about, that uh, the thorn in the flesh of Paul is the people who continue following around from city to city trying to ruin his work. Um, the Judaizers are, who are changing his gospel to faith plus Judaism, but in this case it's not the gospel, it's just they, they want to kill him, so they're following him. And they, uh, they persuade the people uh, to stone him. Now, it says here, suppose they have stoned Paul, and supposing he had been dead. Now, this is an interesting point, because I've heard it taught that uh, they believe that Paul was stoned to death. I mean, they, why would you think he's dead, unless, unless he's dead? Uh, and if he was dead... People connect the dots there and say, well, this is the time he went up to the third heaven and had this experience that he talks about at a later time when Paul says there was a man and uh, he went up to the third heaven and uh, he, uh, let me see, uh, there are same things that uh, he didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body. This is how Paul explains it. But that particular incident or experience, some people attribute to this when Paul was stoned to death. And now I don't know. I, I don't have any confidence one way or the other, but I'm just explaining to you what, uh, what I've studied from how other people see this stoning, that he was stoned to death. Um, and then the interesting thing is... Um, he rose up and and the next day and came into the city. So he rose up and came right back into the city where he was just stoned. Uh, that's is that insane? Is that or is that courageous or what? They just stoned him and left him for dead. They t he's taken outside of the city and uh, he goes right back into the city where he got stoned. Is this a glutton for punishment? Is this the act you know, total defiance? Is this just confidence? He's going to show the people that look, you killed me, but I'm back. You can't stop me, even with stoning me to death. Um, and they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many. They returned to Lystra and Iconium. This is where the people came who were pursuing him, where he was there going to stone him originally. The first case where they were trying to wanted to stone him and they fled, he goes right back to there again. Uh, I think I don't know. If, uh, I don't. I, that's verse twenty-one. I don't remember what verse I ended up on on, on the first reading, but uh, that's through verse twenty-one. So let, before I go, if we're reading any further, let me get any more thoughts. I think you did end at verse uh, 21, brother. But let me just let me just say this: that uh, you know, uh, there were times where the Lord led the disciples, you know, the apostles, to go in a direction from where they actually wanted to. Uh, and then there, there's there's this where apparently there there's it doesn't say there was any opposition from the Spirit of God to what what they decided to do, especially with with these uh, accounts, like you said, brothers, just boom, went back into the city and then went into those other cities where the guys had come from who were the stoners, you know, stoners. <laughs> uh, you know, just amazing stuff. Just, just was it insane? Was it bold? Was it defiance? Maybe a little of the above, uh, all the above. Uh, just, just crazy for Jesus, just loving Jesus so much that just, hey, I'm totally in God's hands. If they want to kill me, uh, God didn't let it happen before. Uh, if, if he wants to let it happen this time, fine, but I'm going back. This this is just some amazing stuff, brother. Back to you. Okay, brother Joe, any more thoughts before I move on? 
Well, I, I think that uh, I think God gives us a great deal of discretion in, in how we choose to uh, to do things. And uh, I, I am so, so against this thing that says we don't have free will and all of our paths are preordained. Uh, I think Paul was was a, was a great man who was uh, firm in his beliefs. And uh, once he knew the truth, he continued in that vein. I think Peter was a, kind of a loud mouth. Uh, and God took those personality traits uh, when he uh, distributed those apostleships <laughs> into account, and he knew what they would do. But uh, I think this is part of Paul's personality. And uh, now it doesn't say that God directed him or didn't direct him. I suspect this is Paul being Paul. Uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me read on. Uh, verse 21. No, yeah, verse, verse 22. Um, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Well, I better read that with 21. It's, there's a comma after Antioch. I'm going to read 21 and 22 together. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, into Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. I think we'll just stop there with verse 22, and, and uh, there's probably some things to be said just about that. Well, uh, I was just looking in the New King James and the Young's literal translation, and the tribulation there is plural. Uh, the new, the uh, Young's literal says that through many tribulations it behooveth us to enter the into the reign of God. Uh, the New King James, uh, we must through many tribulations, plural once again, enter the kingdom of God. Um, one thing about that that I wanted to say that it, that it doesn't say is that uh, it's required that, you know, uh, in order to enter the kingdom of God, like in, in order to be saved, you got to go through a lot of tribulations. That would be salvation by works. And that's, that's definitely not what this is saying. It's not even implying that. I know, I think I've heard people twist that or examples of people twisting that saying that, uh, you know, if you're not all sold out and totally all in and, you don't go through a lot of tribulations, it proves you're not saved. I don't, I don't believe that at all. Uh, I don't think that's what the text is saying, and that, that's, that's not what the whole of Scripture teaches either. But uh, it, it is a, a, a good thing that they confirmed the souls uh, of the disciples and exhorted them and urged them uh, to, to continue in the things of God, to continue in the faith. Uh, and, uh, well, that's about as far as you got there, brother, but... Uh, I just wanted to point out there what that passage doesn't teach, uh, because we know that justification and salvation is by, by faith alone. Uh, back to you. Yeah, I, I just want to echo uh, what what Ted said. I, that's exactly the points I, I would have made. Uh, you know, there is tribulation. Uh, you know, there is a, a cross to carry, should we choose to do that. Uh, I believe we have the, the choice. They were exhorted to continue in the faith. That didn't mean that they would lose their faith, but continue on their uh, hard road uh, that uh, had been set before them. That they, they chose to walk down. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do want to discourage anyone from picking up the work salvation moniker uh, at every opportunity, and that's what so many people do. Back to you, All right, um, I'm going to read it, that verse in the Amplified. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening and establishing the hearts of the disciples. See, that's how it phrases verse 22, where it says, confirming 
the souls of the disciples. So the Amplified explains that, strengthening and establishing the hearts of the disciples. Uh, um, encouraging them to remain firm in the faith. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there was persecution against against uh, Paul and Barnabas, and uh, back in Lystra and Iconium, that's not where they were stoned, is it? But uh, it was in, I, I'm confusing these towns, but uh, I think they want to make sure these people were aware, don't lose your faith even in suffering. And then it says, um, encouraging them to remain firm in the faith, saying, quote, it is through many tribulations and hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. So, um, there's, um, I remember many years ago at my house, a Bible study I was having that someone came for the first time and his, his emphasis, and, and, you know, everybody seems to have a, a focal point in their Christianity, you know, something that's really, there's a particular thing in, in the Bible or this, like, I remember years ago, we're having a convention of street preachers, and we're having our annual meeting, and they ask everybody just to stand up and say, what is your favorite verse in the Bible? And it's interesting, the verses that they were citing were, not verses I would cite. It's 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 all like you know uh, re rebuking and, and uh, you know just things that have nothing to do with uh, uh, salvation and the free gift. But but uh, uh, this is what their focal point was. Their focal was ah, I'm going to preach and rebuke and tell people to change their lives. And um, well, this um, this young man that came to the Bible study, his focal point of his faith was the point where it says, um, 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 I came to give life and give it more abundantly. He has been, he was just beginning, getting involved and, and being really excited about this name it and claim it faith um, movement uh, that, that we're all familiar with. It says that, hey, God wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to be rich. He wants you to have fancy cars. He wants you to have perfect health. He wants you to have all these things. Just name it and claim it. If you have enough faith, you're going to get it. And this is what he was saying. That God wants us to have an abundant life. And I pointed out to him, Paul. I said, Paul had an abundant life. He had an abundance of suffering. I mean, do you think that you're greater than the Apostle Paul? I mean, as great as the Apostle Paul was, did he have all these blessings, uh, wealth, mansions, fancy chariots to ride in, and, and then just did the best food? No, he had a, one suffering after another, you know, beaten with clubs, stoned, uh, whipped over and over again, in prison, snake bitten, all these things. That was his abundant life. Uh, and so this point here, is that uh, Paul's telling them, don't lose your faith. Verse 22, uh, strengthening and establishing the hearts of the disciples, encouraging them to remain firm in the faith, saying, it is through many tribulations and hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I, it's true that people could take the, this verse and use it to try to support their you know, work salvation, and but um, to me, it's 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 easy to just see it another way, and that is that well, the point here is: look, we were just stoned, uh, we're we're being mistreated. There's tribulations, there's hardships, but don't lose your faith, and uh, it's it's inevitable that we're just because you now put your faith in Jesus doesn't mean that all the suffering in your life is over. All right, anything more before we? Go on. Well, I, I like what you said about uh, someone's focus. Uh, you know, if today uh, we live in the United States in relative freedoms for a while, and uh, we tend to focus on, on different things than uh, a Christian who's living in the Middle East may focus on today. 
And so, you know, it, it also beckons my recall to uh, Paul. Jesus instructed uh, somebody to tell him or told him himself. No, he instructed someone to tell him, uh, whoever that was, all of the things that he would face. So Paul was well aware of what was coming. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, his focus uh, may be different from the person reading the scripture. Back to you, Luke. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go to verse 23. Uh, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended uh, to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And, and when they were come and gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the, the disciples. That's through to verse 28. Well, great stuff there, brother. And uh, just, I, I can't get past uh, the, the first verse there, verse 23 you read, to where once again we've seen this in Acts over and over about prayer and fasting when it comes to committing men uh, to the ministry, elders, deacons, uh, people that are being sent out, like Paul when Paul and Barnabas were sent out. Uh, we just see this over and over again. You know, Paul even admonishes uh, Timothy, uh, "Don't lay hands on anyone too suddenly, uh, lest you know this person turn out not to be a, a faithful witness of Christ, a, a faithful minister or elder deacon." You know, um, uh, through prayer and fasting, there's something with that uh, where they're just. Uh, in these instances, they're totally devoting themselves to God, not, not even distracted by food. Um, just totally dependent on God, to God's leading, to God's direction and, and uh, discernment into who would be the right elders for, uh, uh, it says, in every church. So obviously, uh, multiple places, multiple churches, bodies of believers, when they had prayed with fasting, uh, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Uh, we say, Lord, we're 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 committing these, we're setting these guys in your hands to do your will, uh, to do your work of the ministry, because we believe they're they're the right ones for this job. They're qualified. Uh, their lives show that that they're dedicated to you, and um, there's something to that. Uh, it's it's a, I think it's in James where it says, uh, uh, those who are who are teachers are going to be. Uh, given, you know, more harsher judgment, more uh, stricter judgment, I think would be the way to say it nowadays, uh, because of the obligation, because of the responsibilities involved in uh, eldership and leadership <coughs> over other believers and ministry to other believers. And it just talks about the other places they came to, uh, uh, the regions they sailed to and so forth, and uh, recommend to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled and completed so they weren't they weren't cutting any corners is, is what I'm getting here and uh, verse 27 uh, I think you probably would like us to make a, uh, a point there Luke that uh, when they were come to uh, where is it Antioch again <clears throat> they gathered the church together and rehearsed all that God had done with them saying listen our, our work isn't fruitless uh, our work is, is God's work. It's not fruitless. God is doing great things despite all the tribulation and trials and hardships these guys were going through. They, they were still telling the disciples and the, the Christians there, listen, God is doing great things. Lives are getting changed by the gospel. Uh, and he uh, it says he rehearsed all that God had done with him and how he, God, had, had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, just reminding them once again, they're included 
Everybody in Christ has it is in on equal footing, equal basis. There's no difference, Jew, Gentile, males, females, slave free. All are one in Christ Jesus. And uh, and it says, and they abode there a long time with the disciples. Maybe we'll have to uh, refer to you, Luke, on your timeline maps about maybe how long that is. Maybe it's not important, but uh, a lot of stuff going on there, and a lot of probably a lot of time had passed in these passages by the time we get to chapter 15. Over to you, Joe. Well, it's hard sometimes to add fresh insight when you cover things so well. Um, what you said uh, is, is on the money. Uh, what I would add to it is that uh, these, you know, Paul is going about the work of an apostle, establishing churches, establishing the body, uh, and moving from town to town. And one thing that that, uh, that I'm thinking is that he's not just establishing congregations and administrative duties. He is having a love affair within the body of Christ. He's developing relationships. He's uh, sealing familial ties. You'll, you'll uh, come to mind that later in the uh, scripture, Paul refers to these people that he's been with and taught and and uh, administered as ch his children, you know, uh, in the faith. And uh, so w w what we see is uh, a body of Christ developing and growing. And it's, and it's not simply an administrative and uh, population thing. It really is familial ties and, and uh, deep loving relationships uh, that make up the church. And so uh, this this time that he spent with them, it says he, he stayed there for, for an extended period. Uh, I think that was the purpose rather than uh, just establishing uh, order. Over to you, Luke. All right. I, I want to read from 23 on in the Amplified. Um, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they entrusted them to the Lord in whom they believed and joyfully accepted as the Messiah. When they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, uh, no, then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. Uh, when they had spoken the word of salvation through faith in Christ in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch. Verse 26, let me see that in the KJV. Huh. Verse 26 in the Amplified. Okay, it does say sailed. I didn't remember it being saying sailing. And then sailed to Antioch, okay? Uh, from thence there, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work which they had now completed. Arriving there, they gathered the church together and began to report in great detail everything that God had done with them and how he had opened the, the, gen, uh, the Gentiles a door of faith in Jesus as the Messiah and Savior. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Um, the footnote here on the Amplified um, it says the first missionary journey lasted about 18 months, uh, but that's the going from city to city. That's not that does not answer the question about verse 28, and they stayed there a long time. So, in other words, all those travels, and then the, it was after 18 months they came back in Antioch, and they were in Antioch a long time. Regarding how long, let me just see if the timeline I refer to has uh, would, would tell us uh, chapter 14 uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't really specify in this timeline how long they stayed there um, Hmm. 
Yeah, I can't really tell you on that. Um, all right, I guess we're ready to, to move on to the next chapter. But uh, I, what I find interesting is, is uh, they, the, the account that we just read, this is probably the same thing that they told to the church at Antioch when it says that they, they, um, they had gathered the church together and they rehearsed all that God had done with them. So pretty much this chapter is probably what they were explained to them. These are the things that uh, that happened on our journey. And so, the thing, another thing here says um, in verse 27, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So you, you read that in the KJV, and, and some people would say, see, uh, this, is, this is when the Gentiles were offered salvation by Paul. But uh, as we showed, you know, earlier, at, uh, the 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 salvation through faith in Jesus, believing in in uh, He's the promised one, and His death, burial, and resurrection, and faith in Him for salvation. That same message that Paul is preaching, that message was pe preached by Peter, um, uh, you know, twenty uh, ten ten years earlier, uh, actually. Uh, I forgot the timeline on it, but yeah, I think Cornelius was 10 years. After Pentecost, it was 10 years before Gentiles came in. And then it was another 10 years before uh, Paul started his uh, first missionary journey. But the point here is in verse 27, it says, uh, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. But the, 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 the faith was opened to the Gentiles 10 years earlier. All right, uh, before we go on to the next chapter, any other thoughts? Just that uh, you know, it was offered to the Gentiles uh, the first sermon Peter ever spoke, and, and officially, I think uh, at Peter's revelation of Cornelius. And so uh, I, I said that is the timeline I remember. Thank you. Luke. Okay, now let's move on to the next chapter, chapter fifteen in the KJV, verse one, and certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just, let's just take, take that one verse right there. Go ahead. Well, okay, well, we don't necessarily know who they were because they're not identified, you know, by name. Uh, or anything else, uh, but uh, this is definitely uh, a false teaching here that, that these guys are embracing, um, and I'm glad it wasn't uh, very well received, especially we, we see the very next verse you're coming up, Paul and Barnabas are going to confront that head on, uh, but uh, this nowadays could be, uh, let's just say, uh, if we were going to have an example nowadays, it It'd say, you know, uh, unless you're water baptized, uh, you know, by our minister in our church, uh, you cannot be saved. And uh, even if you do that, well, it's kind of hope and wish for the best that you might be saved, and you'll find out one day when you stand before God. That's what I was raised in. So uh, this is this is not the gospel. This is a perversion, and uh, I think it nullifies the grace of God. It, it has people believe the wrong thing and believe in the wrong thing. Uh, only God knows who's saved and who's saved in spite of even bad theology. Uh, but um, this is definitely a perversion, and this is uh, what uh, Paul and the early Christian church and every Christian minister has had to deal with when it comes to sharing the gospel. What is the true gospel? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what is it that we must do to be saved, <laughs> you know, and we know it's, of course, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. He died for our sins. He rose again. He, he did it all. If, if that wasn't enough, then my goodness, what else, what else is left? If it's up to us, it's, it's endless, the things we would have to fulfill if it's by works. 
but we know it's not by works. And uh, circumcision obviously is a work. It's something other than faith. Anything other than faith to me uh, is is adding to the work of Christ. And we can go on and on about this. I see why you stopped at verse one. <laughs> uh, let's go over to Joe. Yeah, that's a, this is a bit of a, a sticky wicket, isn't it? <laughs> because, you know, yeah, yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. Uh -huh. Oh, one last thing. Uh, you've got a little cutting on your... Uh, uh, well, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about the Buddhists. You know, they have some good points. You know, that's a, this is a big deal. It's no small matter to get whacked like that as an adult. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking back to the Old Testament where, you know, the sickness hits you worst on the third day after this happens. And so, you know, this there were people who, uh, in their ze uh, zealotry, probably said, okay, well, let's let's get to whacking, you know. And, and that that's a, that's a, a no small matter. And so uh, I feel real bad for those guys. Uh, being adults and whatnot, you know, I'm one of those people, and I, I think I'll get you know, a lot of people disagreeing with me here, and probably you too also, but I'm one of those people that think uh, more along the lines of what Ted just said, God knows the heart. Now, there are people out there <clears throat> that say, well, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and offers this to you as a, a gift for salvation, but you also have to wear a funny green hat and learn how to ride a unicycle. I'm, I'm persuaded that they're probably saved and silly. Uh, I made a video about this once and got just a ton of people throwing rocks at me. But uh, I think God knows the heart, and I think there's a lot of people back then who said, yeah, I accept Christ's sacrifice, and man, is it a downer, I've got to get circumcised. But I, I don't think that nullified their salvation. It just made them uh, doctrinally incorrect and quite uh, in a state of pain. I, I you know, I, I think, like Ted said, God knows the heart, and if you've accepted His gift, uh, I think that these add-ons are uh, a cruel yoke to be under. But I don't believe it's nullifying of one's salvation. Uh, some people will call that saying, "Okay, well, work salvation is going to be saved." Uh, I don't want to go that far. I, I do want to say that if, if you believe something in error, but believe in uh, Christ dying for your sins correctly, that, uh, that God knows the heart. So I'll leave it there. Over you, Luke. Mm -hmm. oh, while you were talking, I went outside to my front yard and I got a bunch of stones ready. I'm going to join those people and throw some stones at you now. Um, we've talked about this over and over again. I'm, I'm surprised you bring it up again. Uh, you even use the word, <coughs> you don't think it nullifies. <coughs> what I find interesting is that that's the very word that's used in a verse that says it does nullify it. If you add anything to grace, it nullifies it. So to me the distinction is if a person um, initially, you know, now salvation only takes, it's, an, uh, it's a one-time event that happens. It's not a process. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an event, and it happens in an instant. And, that, and, and it only happens, it has to happen one time, and that is they must believe in Jesus for their salvation. Now, what does it mean to believe in Jesus or to believe that Jesus is your Savior? It means that your faith is entirely in him and not uh, divided between uh, faith in Jesus and circumcision or faith in Jesus as in anything else. As Ted said, anything apart from faith in Jesus uh, is, is uh, something that you're contributing. You have to understand that you contribute nothing. So if a person initially believe, has faith in Jesus and nothing else, they get saved. But if initially someone says, uh, uh, well, like these guys, if they, pre if they present the gospel, believe in Jesus and you've got to be circumcised, that person is not going to get saved. 
because they're never putting their faith in Jesus. They're putting their faith in a combination of Jesus and circumcision, and that nullifies the grace of God. Uh, now, the, the only uh, exception I can offer on this is that if that person does have that moment in time where their faith is in Jesus and they get saved, and then later on they get apostate, they, they, they get uh, fall into some bad doctrine, they don't lose their salvation. But you cannot get initially saved. Unless your faith is in Jesus, it can't be divided. Um, I hope someday you'll finally uh, you know, see how important this, this is. It cannot be divided. The scripture even says it's, it's got to be entirely by grace. If you, anything else, you nullify the grace of God. There is no grace. It's, it, you're not saved. Um, now, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the... Um, the, the reason I stopped after one verse is because there's a lot of things here. It says, and certain men. We're going to see this term, I think, again, and we're also going to see these men referred to as men from James. Uh, that's how it's phrased in, in Galatians. And in Acts, I, I, I can't remember if it's phrased that way or not, but these certain men are men from James in the respect that they're coming from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem church, which is headed by James, and in the Jerusalem church, they haven't come to the understanding at this point that Judaism is not part of salvation. They they grow up practicing Judaism. They don't. They, now they now they're they, it's revealed to them that oh Gentiles can be included. Oh what a shock! We thought it was only for for Jews, but okay. So that's the first thing that they needed to be learned. Uh, to be corrected on, but this idea of continuing in Judaism and circumcision is uh, one of the requirements in, in Judaism. Circumcision, dietary laws, mosaic laws, temple worship, animal sacrifices, these are all the things that must be discarded. Um, so this is really talking about, uh, it says circumcision, but it's really just the one of many things that they're going to try to impose they want to impose all of Judaism on these, uh, on everybody, not only the Jews but even the Gentiles. And this is the argument that will happen at this uh, council in Jerusalem that we're, we're approaching quickly here. Um, so the certain men, they're from Jerusalem, and this is where the false teaching is, is because it's the Jerusalem church. They're all Jews there. And this is not Antioch. They're, they go up to, I'm assuming that 15.1, is, is connected to 14, uh, whatever it was, the last verse in chapter 14, where it says they were in Antioch. So I'm assuming these men are coming from Judea, perhaps even Jude, uh, Jerusalem itself, and they're coming to Antioch, and they're going to, what? You're not teaching they have to be circumcised? And let, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So um, this is the... Uh, second big uh, argument and kind of crisis in the church. The first is Gentiles have to be included, and second is, and Paul, this is the argument that Paul has to carry on more than anybody else. It's his responsibility, and that's why so much of Paul's writings is to address this very point. Uh, Romans, Galatians, uh, Hebrews, that's what they're entirely written about, is that you can't, you've got to give up Judaism. It's got to be entirely Christianity. Uh, all right. Um, anything else before? Uh, let me see. Uh, 46. Yeah, we probably have time for another verse, but any more thoughts before I go on? Yeah, I think we once again, uh, the thing we have to remember is, is sometimes what the scripture doesn't say. And it says when uh, uh, certain men who came down from Judea, uh, even if they came from uh, it says they came from Judea, not specifically from Jerusalem, but uh, and it doesn't, and it certainly doesn't say. Not only does it not say specifically from Jerusalem, but it says that uh, they came from Judea. And one thing I wanted to point out is that it doesn't say they came on behalf of James or under the authority of James to uh, to teach this nonsense that they were teaching. It doesn't say that. So I think that's a point. We're going to see that. Uh, James and the uh, the church at Jerusalem, uh, by the time we get to the middle of, well, actually chapter 15, 
around verse uh, uh, 12 and uh, 13, we're going to see that uh, James is clear that he understands now that the, the Gentiles aren't under any obligation to, uh, I think they, they have four things they're going to come up with that the Gentiles should observe, and they're all common sense and a lot good for physical health and spiritual health, uh, but not in regard to salvation, just in regards to uh, what they should practice or not practice. But uh, just want to point that out, what the scripture doesn't say. Back to you. Well, you, let's, let's not go ahead. When we get to uh, the, uh, the council in Jerusalem, we can discuss all that then, exactly what is said and, and uh, how they try, attempt to resolve this issue. Uh, that we're just we're not there yet, so I'm going to reserve my comments on that for that time. But regarding the men from James, I'm in, I'm in inserting it as something to consider because I've already spent years connecting the dots, and I can see that this is all connected to what's coming from James and the, the Jerusalem church, and it doesn't end at the Council of Jerusalem, as as we'll see uh, that. Uh, this argument continues uh, on, and uh, but I'm not going to go any further until we get there. So, um, all right, let me see. Unless uh, Brother Joe, anything else before I go to the next verse? No, nothing on this. Okay, all right. Um, verse two. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenis and, and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But verse 5 is where uh, we get into more of a problem. But let me just stop with verse 4 because we're going to be running out of time. So let me get your comments up through verse 4. Well, it, I think it just uh, shows their, their travels and their transition. And uh, really, I don't know if I can say anything beyond what the text says. I mean, they're, uh, they want to go and, and straighten this matter out. And that's why they're going uh, to Jerusalem to do that. And uh, they're sharing the good news of what God had done for them uh, along the way. So it uh, doesn't say that they had any troubles in these travels. Uh, uh, they, were, they were uneventful in the, in the negative sense. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Back to you. Yeah, what, what, I, what's, what uh, jumps out at me is the great joy. And so uh, I go back to my prior point that... Uh, uh, this is a, an establishment of the body of Christ, and there was uh, a great deal of love and a great deal of uh, uh, sharing, communion, and uh, God's presence, uh, especially through these apostles. And uh, it's uh, the church in its infancy uh, growing up in love and uh, some tribulation. Back to you, Luke. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, well... Uh, first, it, it says there was no small dissension. Let me read it in the Amplified. Paul and Barnabas disagreed greatly and debated with them uh, over this. Circumcision is required. No, it's not required. So that's the argument that they had. Uh, so they decided to go up to Jerusalem and have a, have a meeting with the apostles to address this, this disagreement. Uh, so in their travels... Uh, um, you know, they're just they give an account to of uh, in Jerusalem about uh, the success that they've had with the Gentiles. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing more that really needs to be said about that. We'll pick up with verse five. Let me see. This is fifteen, verse five. Next time. Um, all right. Uh, let me get your summary, and then we'll finish the study. Well, we've covered a lot today, and uh, it's all uh, just some amazing things. I mean, there's there's miracles going on. Uh, there's there's people trying to worship other humans, <laughs> and Paul and Barnabas obviously deny that. Uh, people are, are trying to uh, just adore them as if they were gods from heaven. 
Uh, Paul says, no, that's, that's, you know, please worship the God of heaven, worship the true God, and uh, just uh, the, the, the love-hate that, that's going on there with Paul and Barnabas, the, 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 the people either totally for them or the Pharisees and the Judaizers that are against them, and uh, them just exhorting, and as Joe pointed out so so brilliantly, that, that they're they're building up the love and faith in the churches and among among the believers there. They're building up building them up as a family, as the family of God, those who truly belong to the Lord. And uh, it's it's a great thing to see that encouragement and and uh, edification that they're bringing to other people to build them up, uh, even in the midst of their their tribulations. And uh, as we get into chapter 15, we're going to see that there has to be, within a loving family, there has to be uh, the, the confrontation of, of uh, something that causes error and uh, dissension and division in the body of Christ, and that's, uh, that's where we're at so far. So good stuff. Back to you, brother. Yeah, I, I, uh, I see the love-hate uh, relationship going on here. I'm, I'm uh, reminded of... Uh, the verse Luke uh, brought up yesterday of uh, Christ did not come to uh, uh, unite everybody but to divide people uh, and and I think uh, the division comes between those who uh, respond to the light that is given and those who prefer darkness and that's what we see happening here and those who respond to the light given are uh, becoming part of the body of Christ and there's no small amount of uh, of, uh, disagreement here within within the body of Christ regarding uh, the circumcision and uh, and they're going to straighten it out and so uh, this has been an exciting uh, uh, section of scripture that we went over uh, you know Paul being stoned as dead and revisiting every single place that has sought to kill him and, uh, and continuing his ministry and uh, now we're coming to the Point of uh, church administration and, and doctrine, and so a uh, very profitable part of Scripture. Back to you, Luke. Um, the, um, you know, the, in the introduction to this uh, book of Acts, I remember explaining it that it's uh, many people uh, use the term transitional. And descript to describe the book, and, and it, it shows the transition the church went through. This is a the, basically the first 30 years of church history. Uh, and in, in this, what did it transition from, and what did it transition to? Well, it transitioned from um, um, Jews who practiced Judaism religiously uh, to believing in Jesus and it was the Messiah, the Christ, faith in him for salvation. Uh, but they were continuing to practice Judaism and Gentiles were not included in this. That's how it started. And then gradually things change. Gentiles are, are uh, God reveals that Gentiles are equal to them and they're, they're to be included. And, and then we see that circumcision, a dietary laws first, then circumcision, and then all laws of Moses, all these things of Judaism are saying, it's argued that that's not part of this. It has to be discarded. You cannot divide your faith. And, and then the final point is, I look at the, one of the timelines I look at, and it says that, uh, let me see, if I'm getting the date right, it says, uh, it looks like uh, roughly uh, 63 AD, say, 63 AD, it says Israel set aside. What does that mean? It, it means that they finally reached the point where they, 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 that, that this is a Gentile religion. Now, Gentiles can now, it's, it's kind of reversed. It's Jews, it's for Jews only. Oh, okay, we'll let Gentiles in. And then it transitions finally where Christianity is a Gentile thing. It's not a Jewish thing. But Jews can participate, but they've got to become Christians. They can't be Jews and Christians. You've got to give up Judaism. And that means when I say give up Judaism, you've got to stop believing. Put your, you can't, faith cannot be in Judaism. And, and so 
this is what happens. The, uh, the beginning and then the very end of this transition is that, uh, you know, Israel's set aside in terms of, of the Judaism, that it becomes a Gentile faith. But Jews are welcome, but they've got to become Christians and give up Judaism. Uh, so this is what we find in this whole book of Acts, and uh, we're, we're seeing that, you know, we're only halfway through it, so it's very interesting, uh, very important to understand this, because a lot of these things that were problems in the beginning of the, the church have persisted. Uh, this, the Judaizers, the, the, the Pharisees, there were people who were actually called Pharisees and believers. Pharisaical believers, uh, and they, uh, guess what? We have Pharisaical believers today. We call them modern-day Pharisees, people that are, are arguing today that you've got to follow the Ten Commandments. You, you've got to, you know, uh, follow the law. Faith is not enough. So and this, this problem, this argument, even though through the Scriptures it got resolved, but in terms of man's uh, understanding of Christianity and, and, and uh, the way that various people perceive it and believe in it, it's still all those errors in the beginning are still alive and well today. Matter of fact, I would say that 90% of all so-called Christian churches in the world are like this Jerusalem church that thinks that these laws are still part of our faith. Um, all right. All um, right. I guess we, did we sum up everything? I forgot. That was the summary for each of us, right? All right, let me give, the gospel message is, is, is something we, let me relate it to what we talked about today. Uh, circumcision, uh, or following the commandments, or following the golden rule, or following any set of religious rules. Do you think that's how you get to heaven? Do you think heaven is a reward for a life well lived? Do you think you get to go to heaven if, if you behave well enough? Well, uh, that's what religion is. Religion simply means um, that here's a system of things that you're required to do in order, in your attempt to earn approval from God. But there's a saying that Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship, a relationship with Jesus. That relationship means that we worship him and we rely on him. We believe he's our Savior God. Our faith is in him, and we no longer have faith in ourselves, in anything that we can contribute. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready, ready to reject everything else and instead rely completely on Jesus, he'll give you eternal life as a free gift. That's the gospel. That's the good, good news. Uh, so Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He became a man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He said he became a man so that he could die. And he did. He died on the cross. And that death on the cross, the Bible says, that served as a payment for all of our sins. So your sins are paid for. Now Jesus will give you eternal life if you put your faith in him completely. And he raised himself from the dead. He said it was a sign to prove that his claims are true. That, he, that you, your faith in him is justified because of the resurrection. All right, so I hope you put your faith in him now. And uh, thank you for watching, and uh, maybe we'll do this again tomorrow. We try to do it daily at 2.30 Pacific time. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.